do this. All right. Well, welcome to our audience members and to our speaker, Dr. Eric Flametti. He is a uh, assistant professor of geosciences at Denison University. Uh, he's going to be giving us a seminar today on using crystal ages and compositions to understand how volcanoes come back to life. It's like zombie volcanoes or something. So, Dr. Clemente, please take it away. All right. Well, hopefully everyone can hear me fine, and thanks for uh, being uh, in the audience there or wherever you are uh, around the world or around the internet. But um, hopefully I can talk about some stuff that I've been working on at a couple different volcanoes around the world, thinking about how volcanoes um, uh, return to life after spending a lot of their existence quiet. So uh, I'm going to throw the slides up now and we can uh, get rolling. So, all right. So the work that I've been doing lately has been mostly at Lassen Peak in California, and this is what, where we start. So this is a, a picture of Lassen Peak here in front of us. Um, the sort of gray, brown, darker stuff right in the middle here, right in the middle of the shot, is um, the most recent stuff that's only about 99 years old. So pretty young volcanic rocks for the Cascades. Uh, you know, what we've been trying to figure out is what exactly, how long did it take those uh, new lavas that erupted 99 years ago, uh, how long did it take to get them to form? And then what are the processes that, that happen to get these magmas to go from being somewhere underground to erupting on the surface? Uh, and it's a project that has involved quite a few students of mine. Uh, Denison is an undergraduate only institution, so we've had, I've had the pleasure of working with three different undergraduates on this program. Um, up in the top left, Matt Ring uh, did a senior thesis. There he is working at the Shrimp Lab. Uh, I'll talk about the shrimp in a little bit, but the Shrimp Lab at Stanford, blasting some zircons with an ion beam. Um, Liz Bertolet uh, has worked on this project actually for the last two summers and is doing a senior th thesis thing on Lassen. Uh, Lindsay Hernandez this last summer also worked on some of the older rocks uh, from Lassen. And then I, I actually even had a, a high school student working on some of this project uh, over the last this last summer as uh, Reed Patrick looked at um, the whole rock compositions of a bunch of lavas that erupted over the last about 800,000 years at Lassen. So it's been a, a collaborative project where a lot of this work uh, couldn't have been done without all this help from my students who have been enthusiastic about doing things that might seem fairly tedious like crushing rocks and uh, separating zircon out of them. Um, so it's been it's been a lot of fun. So when people think about volcanoes, the average person on the street, when if you ask them to, to describe a volcano, this is probably what's going to come into their head. It's a nice, beautiful cone with a maybe an explosion happening with a towering column of ash above it, pyroclastic flows coming down the side. Although you know th those again are sort of uh, the visions that people might have is just ash and hot material coming out. Um, but really, when you think about volcanoes, most of their history, they spend not erupting. So the, what really goes on to make the lavas that erupt at a volcano happens during the periods when the volcano isn't actually doing anything at the surface. So when geologists, especially volcanologists and petrologists, I'm a volcanologist, um, slash petrologist. Petrology is just the study of magmas, really. Um, when we think about volcanoes, we kind of picture something more like this, which is a little ex less picturesque, but we're thinking about what's going on down underneath the volcano. So this is what, uh, what might be termed sort of a schematic diagram of a magma chamber or a magmatic system. And it's, it's complex, but what I really want you to get away from this is that when we're thinking about what's underneath a volcano, it kind of comes in a bunch of different forms. Some of it is liquid, meaning the magma that can erupt. Some of it is a mush, which is lots of crystals and a little bit of liquid. Some of it is areas that are mostly crystals, like towards the edge there, that are labeled as melt impregnated or cumulates, mostly crystals that are act like a solid. 
And then there's a lot of different things that happen. You can have new magma coming in, and we call it recharge. You can have an eruption that's going to remove stuff from the system. But what we're thinking about is what how much of the time does that magma system spend liquid enough to actually... And the answer is, uh, to give away some of the, the conclusions here, the answer is that it probably doesn't spend much of its life with magma beneath it that's able to erupt. And most of the time the magma actually spends um, unable to erupt and it takes special events underneath the volcano to actually get it to the point where the stuff that's underneath there is gonna, going to come out the top in the form of some sort of an eruption. And we, kinda, we, we see that in, in different ways, is that we, the textbook model for uh, uh, what's underneath a volcano is that you have magma, a big vat of magma that's all liquid, and then it slowly cools and solidifies into something like a big pile of granite. And what we find is that if we look at what we call the plutonic record, the magmas that cooled underground, they show a lot of evidence that there, they weren't just a big vat of liquid, but really they were a, a mix of lots of crystals and, li and some liquid, that being the actual molten magma, and they would behave kind of like we think sediments behave on the surface, like in rivers, where sediment can be carried around. These are these sort of white things. If you look at the picture in the middle, there's these white rectangular things. Those are actually big crystals. And they're being moved around like sediment in a river, which implies that you have underneath the volcano a, a, a pile of crystal mush that can kind of move around and form these plumes of crystals that are moving through other crystals so that the underneath the volcano is really a mush that goes from being acting like a solid to acting more like, like a live around. And what that tripping point is and how long it spends in those two phases is, is an ongoing question. So, you know, why do we even care about this? It seems a little esoteric to think about how we interpret rocks that have solidified Modified underground. Uh, in, uh, in Iceland, right now, we have an eruption going on. Uh, right in the middle here, our current eruption at Hualahron. Um, and up here at Astja, it's a volcano that erupted rhyolite about uh, in 1875. Rhyolite is a high silica magma, uh, and after the eruption, there's likely material that's cooling underneath the volcano, crystallizing in the form of a crystal mush. And the question is, with all this new basaltic, hot basalt magma intruding underneath the volcano, is that going to rejuvenate? We call it rejuvenation. Is it going to wake up that volcano and cause a new eruption to occur? Uh, and so far at Astra, we haven't seen that. But, you know, what are the time scales? How long does it take for, for a big mush that's sitting underneath the volcano to heat up and then to start erupting again? And what I use to sort of examine this question is, is a very useful mineral called zircon. Zircon doesn't exist in a lot of, you know, for m most of the rocks that we look at, it's only less than a percent of the rock, much less than a percent of the rock is made of zircon. But zircon is a tiny little crystal. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, the crystal in the top left corner there is probably only about 100 microns long, tiny. Uh, but it's a little time machine because it it has the right elements in it that we can use to uh, read as a, a clock. So as uranium-238, which is down on the x-axis here, decays to thorium-230, we can look at the ratio of different isotopes, and as the crystal ages, it shows up in different places in this what we call a um, uh, isochron diagram to look at the age of those crystals. So we can actually analyze individual zircon crystals, measure the uranium and the thorium and the lead, and come up with a date for when that crystal formed. So we can start to use those to then look back at the history of that volcano. And uh, the way we do that is with um, one of the most inappropriately named instruments uh, I can imagine. Imagine this is in fact about a room-sized mass spectrometer to collect that collects data, isotopic data, on minerals that you analyze. 
So down here at the bottom is um, a figure that we have uh, what's actually happening. You have a zircon that you've mounted in some sort of uh, medium. In this case, we, we just stick them in epoxy. And then you polish them, and you hit them with an ion beam. So this is a primary oxygen beam. It's a beam of oxygen, and it hits the surface of the crystal and releases secondary ions, which then go shooting down the flight tube. If you look at the instrument up in the top left corner, they go shooting down the instrument and then collect it at this in a uh, ion counter down at the far end of the instrument. And we can measure at very low abundances of different isotopes that we can then use to calculate an age for the crystal. So we're using an instrument that gives us really high resolution of ages and good spatial resolution. You can analyze things as small as 20 microns across, which is a, smaller than those crystals that I was showing you. So we can actually analyze individual crystals or even zones within crystals to tell us uh, what age they formed. So what the that we would start to think about what, what are the zircon that we find in these magmas actually recording. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can interpret. So the, in this diagram here on the left, the little sort of um, uh, doubly terminated crystals are zircon, and this is supposed to get at the idea of where zircon might be coming from. They might be coming from the mush. They might be crystallizing in the liquid. They might be coming from the rock all around the magma chamber. So what we're trying to do is look at what these little zircon crystals are actually recording when we're looking um, looking at. Are they recording events that happen right before an eruption? Are they recording the events after an eruption happens? One of the things most people don't realize about volcanoes is that when there's an eruption that occurs, more magma stays underground. It actually doesn't erupt eventually erupts, so that you end up with a lot of leftover crystals that are left behind. Um, you know, are these zircon recording all the events that have no eruption that goes along with it? Are they giving us that record of events that happen during the time the volcano's quiet? You know, are they just recording things that are near the death of the volcanic system? Things are cooling down and you're forming zircon. Are they telling us a little bit about all of these things? Um, so what we're trying to do is use the ages to tell us something about what events the zircon is recording. And not only that, we can use ages, but we can also use the composition of the zircons themselves. So the zircon, if you're, so this diagram up here, the zircon is a little uh, lost in the black. Um, but B is a transect that I ran across a zircon using an electron microprobe, which actually blasts a beam of electrons into the crystal to tell us what it's made of. Um, but what, this, what you can do is look at the composition of zircon, let's say looking at elements like hafnium or yttrium or europium um, or uranium or thorium, look at the composition of the zircon and match that to the age of different parts of the zircon to tell us what the magma was like when that part of the crystal formed. So the example here from A to B, if you look at the profile at the bottom, this is how yttrium changed, where in the middle you can see that yttrium is pretty high, and down on both si other sides of the crystals, so on one side and then the other side, on both sides of the crystals it's a lot lower. And the age of that middle part that's really high correlates with the age, a time in, this is uh, at the Okatina caldera complex in New Zealand, it correlates with a time where a magma that had a lot of yttrium in it happened to be coming into the system. So the zircon was actually recording a period when there was a magma with a lot of yttrium and then recording periods of time where the magmas that, that were coming in were low yttrium. So we can read the zircon like a book where each of the different parts of the zircon are recording different events that happened at a volcano. So here in the Okatina, we're looking at, um, at times when different flavors of magma were coming into the system, and the zircon were recording all of that. And, you know, when we kind of look at the zircon from the Okatina overall, uh, this is a project that I did uh, about five years ago when I was at UC Davis, um, 
different eruptions. So all these orange stars are different eruptions that we sampled. Um, and when you look at the zircon that erupted during these different eruptions, so zircon that came up in these eruptions, they sample it's sampling a large, diverse population of, of crystals. So that at each of these different places that erupted, you are getting zircon that had similar ages, similar compositions. You have the buffet line on the other side because that's what each of these eruptions is more or less doing. It's sampling different parts of the magmatic system, different parts of the crystals, and spitting them back up in the surface during an eruption. So what, what we can conclude is that this whole system is interconnected and you're bringing up crystals that record different pieces of the past history at, at the Okataina, it's over the last 350,000 years, that you're looking at the past history that's being sampled each time this volcano erupts. So it's pretty cool because you can look at a single eruption, like this Terra Ware eruption was about um, 700 years ago, and when you look at the crystal, what erupted in, at Terra Huera, you can actually find crystals that will tell you something about the entire history of this volcano, of this volcanic system, all coming up in, this, in one single eruption. So the zircon are, are preserving bits and pieces of that. So the, the zircon that we're looking at at, uh, Oka, at the Okataina, the Okataina is a really big caldera system. I mean, really big. It's erupted hundreds of cubic kilometers of material in the last 50,000 years. That's a lot of material over a short time. It's a very active volcano, or actually complex of volcanoes. So the question is, if we looked at a smaller volcano, would we see that same sort of sampling of a bunch of different zircon crystals um, that record the entire history of the volcanic system, or would we see something different? And a great place to look at this is Lassen Peak in California. So Lassen Peak is down here. Uh, if you look at the map in the top left uh, right-hand corner, Lassen is the southernmost of the Cascade volcanoes. The Cascades are the um, active chain of volcanoes that run from California into Oregon into Washington. You know, the more famous ones than Lassen might be Mount St. Helens or Mount Rainier or Mount Hood. But Lassen is the southernmost of them. It's actually the only other one that's erupted in the last hundred years other than Mount St. Helens is Lassen Peak. Uh, soon it won't even have that to go for it because, like I said, we're next year is the hundredth anniversary of its uh, last eruption. But Lassen is part of a big complex of volcanoes that's nowhere near as active as the Okataina but still is fairly yeah all these different colors represent different parts of the history of the volcan Lassen volcanic complex where we started off about 800,000 years ago with what's known as the Rockland caldera it's a big uh, it was a a big explosive erup uh, series of eruptions that culminated in the Rockland tephra which is pretty cool because it's a huge uh, volume of material, 60 to 70 cubic kilometers in a single eruption. So much bigger than Mount St. Helens. It's one that probably would be up there with any of the really big eruptions uh, over the last few uh, millennia. But you can find layers of this Rockland tephra that are about a foot thick all the way down in San Francisco, which is a couple hundred kilometers away, which is pretty cool that Lassen is, has the capability of, of creating eruptions that large. <laughs> Um, at least as a volcanologist, we think it's cool. I suppose other people would think cool is not the word to describe it, but it can it can do some impressive things. So um, is that, just to jump in there, Eric, is that the uh, volcano that that awful movie was uh, um, hypothesized to, to blow up again? Which one? Uh, for, from which movie? Uh, what was the one? What was the movie, guys? You have to help me out with cultural references here with um, uh, Volcano. Oh, are you thinking of Dante? Oh, okay. Yeah, are you thinking of Dante's Peak? Dante's Peak. Was it Lawson? Was the... I mean, Dante's Peak was kind of an amalgam of a number of Cascade volcanoes. Okay, okay. Um, I would... Because uh, some shots, I think, are, are... Well, A, the movie was filmed in Idaho, which is one point. <laughs> um, they had some shots that were this, this, the crater at St. Helens. They had other shots that were just kind of CGI mountain... 
I think its location was supposed to be like around Lassen or Shasta, but um, it's so it's it's kind of like a, a a Frankenstein cascade volcano they were using there. But you know, Lassen would be a guy, I suppose. Okay. Um, but anyway, so Lassen it had its big explosive eruptions about uh, you know eight hundred thousand to six hundred thousand years ago. It had some a period of quiet. And then it had a, a, a period known as the Broke-Off Mountain Phase, which was another volcano that formed there that was maybe more like Mount Hood. Mm. That lasted till about 385,000 years ago. And then the modern Lassen uh, is what's known as the Lassen Dome Field, which is the last 315,000 years, where we had what's known as the Bumpus Sequence, which is a bunch of domes and lava flows and some explosive eruptions. And then there's a period of about 100,000 years that nothing happened. It was wow. completely quiet. Eruptive hiatus, we call it, where the whole area, there's no eruptions for 100,000 years. And then since about 90,000 years ago, there's been more activity. We have the Twin Lakes sequence and then the Eagle Peak sequence. And the most recent eruption from the Twin Lakes sequence is the 1915 Lassen Peak eruption. And the most recent eruption from the Eagle Peak sequence is this area known as Chaos Crags which is a great name for a volcano, um, and it erupted about 1,100 years ago. And those are the most recent activity. But there's been a number of these periods of volcanic activity at Lassen over the last almost million years. So, like I said, 100th anniversary of Lassen Peak's last eruption is next year. Uh, this is a picture of the great eruption of uh, May 22nd, 1915. This is taken from 50 miles away. So you could imagine that this was an impressive sight for people down in the Central Valley of California because this was a, a big ash plume. The eruption, as I'll, I'll talk about in a second, the eruption itself was tiny compared to a lot of eruptions that have happened at Lassen. But it had a big explosive component. So it's, it's famous because it was one of the, you know, it's one of the few big explosive eruptions that happened in the continental U.S. since the country was founded, more or less. So the samples that, that are part of the study that uh, I'm talking about today, some of them are from the 1915 eruptions. So if you look in the top right hand, we sampled some of the pyroclastic flows, or I should say uh, my uh, collaborator from the USGS, uh, Mike Klin, sampled um, from the 1915 uh, eruption. You can see the volume of that eruption was tiny, 0 .007 cubic kilometers. That's a small eruption. Uh, Chaos Crags, we sampled some lavas from Chaos Crags. It's a lot bigger. That was the 1,100-year-old eruption. It was about a little over a cubic kilometer of material that erupted. And then finally, we looked at what uh, a day site that makes up most of Lassen Peak. Um, it erupted about 27,000 years ago, and it's actually almost over two cubic kilometers. So the most recent activity is the, the, um, the smallest. And then there's a couple other larger eruptions that we sampled. And what all of these lavas are tend to be really mixed up magmas that, um, that, that make up uh, the most recent activity at Lassen. So we sampled all of those. We extracted zircon from all of these and looked at their ages and their compositions um, to try to understand what is being recorded during what's being recorded in the events prior to each of these eruptions. So here's some uh, pretty pictures of zircon. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a standard zircon analysis where we put the zircon and mount them in epoxy and then polish through halfway through the grain to get to the interior and then analyze our spot here has wandered off a little bit. Uh, it should be right in the middle here. But we analyze the interior of the crystal. We also did some analyses that are kind of new, unique, where you take a zircon crystal, an individual zircon crystal, and you mount it in, in a very soft metal. It's indium metal. And you just press the crystal into that metal, and you can analyze the very outer surface of the grain. So that outer surface of the grain is, is um, we can get at the youngest part of the crystal by analyzing the outer grain. These on the left-hand side, you're analyzing the interior of the crystal. So it's probably some of the earliest part that formed. 
the outer edge of the crystal is telling us what is the last zircon to have crystallized. So we can begin to get an idea what it took for an entire grain to crystallize, or what's the youngest age for any of the zircon that has formed so far. Uh, so some results, an ever-exciting isochron diagram. What you want to get out of this is that there are some of the solid colors, or, or at least the, the brighter colors, which are the interior of crystals, and then the sort of pastels are the surfaces of grains. And what we found out was that none of the zircon that we analyzed are within error of the age of the eruption that we pulled the zircon from. So, for example, in the 1915, we did not find any zircon that were that within error of 1915. They were all much older, probably, you know, thousands to, t actually, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years older than the eruption that they came out of. So, we're not really sampling crystals that are forming in the events that lead up to the eruption, but rather we're sampling crystals that have been around for a while and that are probably crystallizing in the mush that's sitting underneath the volcano, and that mush might is, looks like it's been there for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And even the surfaces of the crystals, the very youngest part of the grain, has, um, is, is old. The youngest zircon surface that we've analyzed is 17,000 years old. And that's from one of the eruptions that happened in the last thousand years. So the zircon are a lot older than the, than the eruptions that are bringing them to the surface. So that tells us something interesting about what might be happening. You know, this is kind of another way to look at it. These are uh, distribution histograms of the ages of the zircons, where the dark squares are the surface ages and the light ones are the interior ages. And what, the thing that I want to point out here is that if we think about when there's this period between about 90,000 and uh, 190,000 years in the middle here that represents when nothing was erupting at Lassen. And what I hope you can see is that a lot of the zircon that formed were crystallizing during this period that nothing was actually erupting. So in theory, these zircon should be recording the events at Lassen that were happening during this time when nothing was erupting at the surface. They're telling us something that we have no record of in terms of lava. Instead, we are getting that record preserved in the zircon that are then spit out during eruptions that happened much more recently. So what sort of information is it recording? Well, these are a bunch of trace elements um, that we looked at. So we have on the x-axis is the age of the crystal. And on the y-axis, we have things like thorium and uranium, europium anomaly, and hafnium. And I'll, I'll kind of go through these quickly one by one to give you a sense of what they mean. For hafnium, zircon that form when the hafnium is lower are coming from magmas that are hotter. So it's inversely correlated. Hot zircon, come from ma or hot zircon have low hafnium contents. The europium in the middle here behaves differently, where the higher europium anomaly means that we have hotter magmas. So hotter it is, the higher the anomaly. And then for thorium and uranium, it's the same thing. Hotter magmas, higher thorium to uranium ratios. So what we're seeing is that during this period when nothing was erupting, the sort of white part in the middle here, we were seeing zircon that were recording warmer temperatures, which is a little counterintuitive, because if nothing's erupting, you'd expect that um, the whole system is just sitting there getting cooler and cooler and cooler. But what we're actually seeing is that even when it's not erupting, we're getting new magmas coming in, and the zircon are recording the fact that there are periods of time when parts of the system are warming up again. And then there's a whole bunch of zircon that record what we kind of call the cold storage of the crystals. That is the main conditions that those crystals are being stored in underneath the volcano. I mean, and this is an interesting, interesting idea. This is something um, 
that uh, is from a recent paper that was in Nature by a couple people that I've worked with on a number of projects, Kerry Cooper at uh, UC Davis and Adam Kent at Oregon State, um, which is my uh, where I got my PhD. Um, they've been, they looked at a bunch of different volcanoes, and that's what this diagram is, is we have a whole bunch of different volcanoes listed across the top. And then these green dots and the blue diamonds are ages of crystals from each of those volcanoes. So they went through the literature, figured out, uh, collected the ages of crystals from these different volcanoes, and then looked at them. And what we find out is that crystals on the whole are much older than the eruptions that they are being pulled from. So this is what, over here it says, apparent crystal residence time, or residence age on the left. This means that those crystals were being stored underneath the volcano for hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of years before they were erupted. Um, and this is kind of what they, what they concluded was the idea that crystals for most volcanoes are in cold storage, unable to erupt for a lot of their history. And specifically looking at Mount Hood, Mount Hood might only spend a few percent of its entire lifetime in conditions that those crystals can actually erupt with magmas. So that most of these volcanoes spend most of their history as places where crystals are being stored, cooling in a mush, and then you have periodic short events that heat the system up and allow the crystals to erupt with magmas, with lavas, um, but those periods of time when the magma is able to actually erupt, when it's not too sticky, too viscous to get out, are probably really short periods of time in the history of the volcano. So the que one question might be, how long are those periods that that magma is able to erupt? Well, one thing we can think about is how hot is, is it actually getting when we're heating up the, heating up the magma? Um, you can see this is uh, now from, this is data from Lassen. Um, and the bottom is ages of crystals, 0 to 350,000 years. On this side are the temperatures that the zircons formed. And we have down at the bottom this area that most of the zircon are forming, about 650 to 720 degrees. That's the conditions, you can see this histogram up here shows you that peak. Most of the zircon are crystallizing in conditions that cold storage, and again, for magmas, cold is like 650 degrees C. Pretty warm for most standards, but for magma, that's the cold storage conditions. And then we have these zircon that are forming at 750 degrees or so and warmer that are represents when the magmatic system is warmed up to the point where it's probably able to erupt. So a whole bunch of these zircon are preserving a record of cold storage when the crystals are just stuck in a mush, crystallizing. And then you have to heat them up. And as you get zircon to grow in warmer conditions, and some of those end up being able to erupt if it gets to the point where the magma is um, no longer stuck underground, in a sense, because it's got so much liquid that its viscosity is low enough to allow it to get out into the surface. So one of the cool things you can do is you can actually use zircon as a stopwatch for this process. So um, zircon here, this is... Um, uh, so zircon is stable in a magma in fairly specific conditions. And by stable, I mean that it's not going to just dissolve away. So when that zircon, if it starts to dissolve away, it's usually in places where the magma is too hot so that it starts to dissolve. So take a zircon crystal that grew at 700 degrees, throw it into a magma that's at 800 degrees or 900 degrees, and it's going to start to dissolve. And you can actually calculate how long a zircon takes to dissolve by um, looking at how we, we call it undersaturated, that magma is, how much that zircon wants to dissolve away. I mean, it's kind of like the idea of putting something um, 
I'm trying to think of a good uh, an analogy here. You know, you're putting something into liquid that the liquid, does, you know, if you put a cube, a, a sugar cube in water, it's going to dissolve away, and you're going to uh, be left with nothing. And you can calculate how long it might take for that sugar cube to dissolve. You're doing the same thing with zircon. Is you're putting a zircon in a magma where it, it's going to dissolve, and you can calculate how long that takes. So this black curve here is a curve that if you took a zircon and put it at 820 degrees, it would take a zircon that has a radius of about 30 microns, so about the size of most of the zircons that we analyzed, it would take a little under 5,000 years to dissolve that zircon. So it means that if you heat a magma to 820 degrees, if you find zircon in the, in the lavas that erupted, it means that it couldn't have been hot for more than about 5,000 years. Otherwise, you would have dissolved away all the zircon. Now, if you take that same zircon and throw it in a magma that's at 900 degrees, it would only survive for about 200 years. So in that case, if we find zircon in those magmas, in the lavas that erupted, we know that it couldn't have been hot for more than a, maybe a couple hundred years. So this is giving us an, a limit. These magmas could not be hot for more than a couple hundred to maybe a, a, a few thousand years. Otherwise, we shouldn't expect to find any zircon in them. The, all the zircon should have dissolved away. So we have a little bit of a stopwatch now to say that the amount of time that it takes to heat up this volcano to get it to erupt has to be pretty short, geologically speaking. It might be decades to centuries to a few millennium sort of time scales. So we can kind of take a bunch of all this, all this data that we've collected and fit it together into a model to think about what might be going on underneath Lassen that can take into account the composition of the zircon, take into account the ages of the zircon, take into account how quickly they're going to dissolve, to think of what is happening. How do we get this volcano to rejuvenate, to be ready to erupt again? Now this is this is the model. It's a schematic model, and I'll kind of walk you through it. To tell you what's going on? On one axis down here, the x-axis is time. In um, it's actually time in in just years, not thousands of years. Um, this is time in years. So thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand years. And then this axis, uh, the y-axis, is temperature. And this curve that, that you see is sort of the, the temperature time path that a zircon, a magma, and a zircon might feel. Where you start off with cold zircon down here in the bottom left, you intrude a bunch of new magma, and you, but you have to heat things up quickly. Because once you reach about, about 740 degrees, the zircon starts to dissolve. And it dissolves geologically quickly, like I said. Tens of years to maybe thousands of years. You heat things up, you reach some sort of maximum temperature that are the temperature that the eruption happens, if, if an eruption happens. You heat it up to the temperature that an eruption happens, you erupt some magma, and then you cool things down. And you, again, cool things down fairly quickly to the point where you are now able to prevent zircon from dissolving. As you're cooling, you go through this period when things are warm, where you get the warmer zircon, and then you head back into the cold storage that the zircon finds itself living in most of its existence. So that these rejuvenation events are pretty short. They might, like I said, might last tens to hundreds of thousands of years, where we heat up a magma, liberate the crystals, so that they can erupt. You dissolve some of them, but not all of them, because you still preserve some of those zircon. And then as you're cooling, you can crystallize some warmer zircon that are forming during the down temperature side of things, as the temperature is going back down again, and then come back into uh, cold storage, where that crystal mush is sitting down there most of the time. So these rejuvenation events are sort of ephemeral 
periods when a new magma intrudes into the system, heats up the mush, liberates some crystals, causes an eruption, actually might not cause an eruption, but sometimes will cause an eruption, and then cools back down again fairly rapidly, uh, geologically speaking, where this whole thing is maybe taking a few thousand years to go from intrusion to back to cold storage again. So, you know, it's kind of, that, that was all data from the last most, the three most recent eruptions in the Lassen field, at least the ones that have zircon in them. We've been starting to look back at the long history of Lassen, where some of the research that Liz and Lindsay did this last summer, they dated uh, eruptions that were a lot older than 27,000 years. We actually went all the way back to dating zircons from the Rockland Tephra, that's about 600,000 years old. And what's interesting is that most of the zircon, again, this, these, uh, this is a histogram showing that most of the zircon are crystallizing towards the end of what we call the bumpus sequence and during this eruptive hiatus. So what's probably happening is that most of the zircon are crystallizing from, um, we could say, the leftovers of that bumpus sequence where you had a lot of eruptions during that about 300,000 to 190,000 years ago. And then since then, there's been a body of magma that has been in a crystal mush state cooling since about 190,000 years ago. And the zircon had been growing in that cooling magma. And that since about 90,000 years ago, things have been getting warm again. So we see many fewer zircon because we started erupting stuff again here. We might actually make that argument, this has happened before, where here's old zircon from the Rockland uh, era, the Rockland tephra over here. Then you might notice there's no zircon that fall into this period, right between about 400,000 and 500,000 years. Well, maybe it's because we've heated that system back up and dissolved all the zircon away. So when we started erupting again here, or when we started erupting during this broke-off mountain phase, we dissolved all the zircon away. So this is really new data. It's maybe only a couple months old, so we're still playing with a lot of ideas of one other option is that you just solidify everything that's left over after the Rockland Tephra, and you can't get those zircon free anymore, which is why you don't see zircon that are this age coming from eruptions that are this age. So there's some interesting things about how um, you might be either erasing zircon uh, because you're heating the system up too much, or you might be just locking zircon up, and um, that really this isn't one continuous volcanic center over the last 800,000 years, but a number of smaller centers that are separate in terms of their uh, magmatic history. You know, and we see, again, when we're looking at different trace elements, similarities that I talked about before. Periods when hafnium goes down, things are getting hot. At the same time, europium's going up. Things are getting um, hot. And repeated patterns where the evidence shows that we had periods where ma new magma was coming in, things were getting hot, eruptions were periods when um, things were cooler, that big bodies of magma might have been cooling into a crystal mush and just sitting down there crystallizing and crystallizing and crystallizing. So, you know, sort of, sort, of, sort of wrap things up with some observations here. Um, you know, for a volcano like Lassen, zircon is really useful because you can combine the ages and the trace elements to tell us what's going on underneath the volcano, even during these periods when it's not actually doing anything, when it's not erupting. You're looking, you're able to read what are the thermal and compositional inputs. What is the flavor of the magma coming in? How much heat is that magma imparting? And is it allowing the magma, the system, to get hot enough to allow an eruption to happen? Um, you know, at Lassen, it's, in Lassen in particular, the zircon seem to be in a state, uh, cold storage for a long time, at least over the last 200,000 years. They sit around in cold storage, and then occasionally they get heated back up again. And those um, rejuvenation events look like they're going to have to be pretty short. Um, so even though it spends most of its time cold, rejuvenation events happen, they're short, and they don't leave a lot of evidence, other than 
what you find in the composition of the zircons. So you have erased a lot of that evidence, but the zircon are that constant recorder of what's going on underneath the volcano. And that, you know, th this is all happening in geologically short periods. A volcano can go from being uneruptible to being eruptible in maybe as few as a couple decades uh, or hundreds of years or something like that. So that even if a volcano is not showing much in the way of activity, there might be the events starting to get things going to cause an eruption to happen again in the uh, geologically near future. So, you know, the difference between an uh, a, uh, active volcano and a dormant volcano, there might be completely, um, you know, the, the, it's a very gray distinction because an active volcano uh, spends most of its time pretty quiet anyway. So at what point do we start calling it active again to cause an eruption? Well, maybe it's when we get these periods that things are warming up again to get things out of cold storage. So you're defrosting a volcano before an, a new eruption happens. So I guess with that, I you know I'll just acknowledge a bunch of collaborators here and the fact that this is a, a funded by the National Science Foundation uh, to help fund me and my students working on this project. Um, and you know it's been a great it was a lot of fun uh, to go out there. This is a Landsat image taken last fall uh, of the Lassen area with Lassen in the middle, Chaos Crags up in the top here. Um, and um, it, we've been able to go and, and, and tromp around there and collect some great samples and think about how, uh, what are the crystals in these magmas, in these lavas that erupted? What are they recording about the whole history of what's going on, you know, three to five to ten kilometers beneath your feet there? So uh, I guess with that, I'll, I'll take whatever questions people have around there. All right. Well, let's thank our speaker. And um, we'll open it up to questions from the audience, both local and online. So if you're uh, listening on the uh, Internet, Use the Google Plus Q and A uh, that's currently live on um, Google Plus, the Google Hangout, or use the Twitter hashtag GHO Seminar or Google Hangout Seminar. Do we have any questions here in the room while we let that happen? I, when, when you're sitting and, and you're watching the, these high temperature crystallizations of, of minerals, um, I, I, I wonder whether whether the chemical processes that themselves can be either exothermic or endothermic. If those energies yeah, affect the geology in any way, none whatsoever, is the geological energy that's causing the heating and the cooling, you know, orders of magnitude larger than the amounts of energy released from turbine reactions? Because these, these crystallization events themselves all also involve energy changes. Is yep, that, I mean, that pale by comparison. Yeah, uh, that I mean, that's a good point. Is that there is what we call the latent heat of crystallization, where as minerals form, they're releasing heat. Well, either and there are some other directions. Yeah. What was that? It, it, it can go both directions, right? It can go both directions. Direction. For a lot of volcanic systems, there is evidence that we can see that as crystallinity increases, temperature goes up, independent of adding any new magma. So there, in that case, for a lot of these systems, the crystals that are forming are probably releasing heat more than anything. And what, to make a difference in the magma? It probably, in some cases, it does, but the temperature difference is small enough that if you were to intrude, you know, most of these magmas are sitting around, like I said, about 700, 725 degrees. The intruding magmas that come in are probably at close to 1,000 to 1,100 degrees. So they're adding, they have a lot of heat, and that they can release... Um, they can impart that heat onto the, the magmas that they're coming up underneath. And I think that heat is going to be a lot more significant than anything that's happening right, that during crystal yeah, yeah. okay. okay. So, Eric, uh, on the left-hand side of your screen there, you should see a button that says Q&A. Yep. I see, I see I have one question from Ron. Got a question. Go ahead and fire away on that question. You okay. know Okay. So I, I guess he's got he's got a number. So the first part of the question is, what other minerals are crystallizing over the same temperature range? Well, looking at these Lassen rocks, most of the stuff that's crystallizing is um, plagioclase feldspar, biotite, amphibole, something like hornblende, 
um, quartz, those are the big ones. So those are not affecting the trace elements. So the ele trace elements that we look at are really not being affected by those other minerals that are forming, except for one, europium. So europium goes into plagioclase feldspar, so different trace elements go into different minerals and different proportions. And europium likes to go into plagioclase feldspar. So in times when the europium anomaly goes down to smaller values, those are periods when lots of feldspar is crystallizing. So that when it goes up, when I said it gets hotter, it's meaning that there's less plagioclase crystallizing. So that's the, some of the ways that we can use different trace elements to tell us different things about both what might be happening with zircon and what might be happening with other crystals. So, you know, in terms of other minerals that might be crystallizing at higher and lower temperatures, I think that the system here is fairly, the composition is, range is narrow enough that we don't get a lot of other minerals. We might get some uh, pyroxene crystallizing, um, but it's not changing a lot over the, the sequence of temperatures we're sitting in. Um, so I think that kind of tackles most of, of Ron's questions um, to at least some, to some degree. <laughs> so I just did a uh, mouse over there on his uh, profile. So Ron is a geologist and a, a gigapan photographer. So that's pretty cool. Yes, he is also another uh, a zircon file. Who has worked on worked on um, with the that lovely mineral as well? So, glad so, so Eric, remind us uh, more about what's going on there with zircon and uranium and, and thorium. I remember watching um, Cosmos, and mm -hmm. people had a, uh, a, a, a an episode about how that was used to basically get the age of the Earth. You guys remember seeing that episode? Give us a quick um, thumbnail sketch of what's happening there so we kind of can remember uh, how that's a useful measure. Okay. Uh, well, so the, if you're trying to determine the age of the Earth, what you're, you're actually, there's different systems, isotope systems we can use. Mm -hmm. Uranium thorium, um, uranium thorium is going to be telling us something about uh, crystals that are relatively young. Because when you look at the decay of uranium to thorium, so uranium, the isotope uranium-238 to thorium-230, you can look at crystals that are up to about 350,000 years old before you can't measure anymore. Okay. There isn't enough there for you to measure. <laughs> or at least you can't, you, you can't not, let, let, me, let me phrase that poorly. You can use it to 350,000 years before you're no longer getting enough new thorium to grow to, to see the difference as it gets older. So you've, you've, um, you're, you're decaying things so you can no longer, it's no longer useful. Now what they talk about in Cosmos is using a different pair of isotopes. You use uranium and you use an isotope of lead. In that case, the time range, instead of 350,000 years being the time range you can date things to, when you're looking at the decay of uranium to lead, you can look at things that are, in theory, older than the universe, <laughs> based on how slowly the decay between uranium and lead actually occurs. So the date of the formation of the Earth is coming from looking at how uranium decays to lead and then measuring the uranium and lead in uh, zircon, let's say some of the oldest stuff on Earth is zircon, you, d you look at how much lead has formed from the decay of uranium, and that gives you the age of the crystal. So that's how we're dating a lot of the earliest stuff on Earth uh, to see when the planet formed. Okay. That may, that may answer your question? Yeah, that certainly did. I forgot that it was uranium lead, and you're right. That, that's a much older, uh, a larger half-life there, so you can get much farther back. Yeah, I mean, the half-life for the uranium lead system is 4.47 billion years, I believe. And for uranium thorium, it's only about 75,000. So 
um, you're looking at answering questions with uranium thorium at looking for things that are much younger than if you're going to try to answer questions for, with uranium lead. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, we've got another question there on the uh, uh, Q and A. Okay. It's um, uh, looking at Hawaii instead of um, Lassen. Um, you know. The, at Hawaii, when they're sampling things, yeah, it more or less is they just take samples whenever they can of lava flows. So the folks that I know at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, that's what you do is you go out there and you sample the lava flows either after they've solidified or um, during when they're flowing. You can actually just go and literally you take a, a metal can and... and try to scrape some lava out of the lava flows themselves or a, a, a metal rod or something like that. So you just periodically sample it and see how the, the compositions might be changing over time. So that's, that's, what, that's how they handle looking at, at what might be going on as the, the lavas erupt at, at Kilauea. And you look at it over the course of months or years, the compositions do change, and they reflect things that are changing underneath the volcano um, as the eruption, you know, this now 30-year-plus eruption has been going on. Other questions? You guys got any questions here? I, I've got one. Uh, I am certainly not a, uh, a geologist. I don't have a lot of experience with that. My, my naive understanding of what was going on under the ground sort of uh, led me to think that it was fairly uniform under there. And so it was, it was interesting to me when you said that, you know, you would see magma uh, in different locations that would have higher or lower concentrations of, say, yttrium or some other yeah. elements. What, what would cause there to be these, this lumpiness? Uh, I mean... I would have thought that it would have been mixed up enough over the 4.5 billion years of the Earth that, that, that I don't know, I, I'm curious. So if, we're, if we get all the way back to magmas forming in the mantle, uh -huh. the, the mantle itself is probably, um, is, is, is not homogenous. It's not just one uniform thing. It's actually got a lot of different compositional variation. If you sample lavas erupting at different places, you'll find that the stuff that's a, that's melting in the mantle to form those original magmas can vary a lot. So the changes, like higher yttrium versus lower yttrium magmas, all of that probably reflects differences in the process that's forming the magma in the mantle. So the mantle is kind of a, a, a you know, the example that I always got in class with plum pudding is an odd analogy in the sense that not many of us know what a plum pudding is. But you can maybe visualize the idea that it's some sort of mix of different materials that you're sampling in different ways, uh, or in different length scales and time scales, maybe. So depending on where you are, you'll get a slightly different flavor of magma, something like that. So it's actually, the Earth is a pretty um, mixed up thing. It's not very uniform in a lot of, a lot of scales. Have we seen evidence of, like, uh, a yttrium-rich uh, upswelling that has appeared in lava uh, at different locations from where it's erupted onto the surface. You could say, oh, well, this is kind of cool. This all must have come from the same uh, chunk. Yeah, I mean, even – the short answer is no. Okay. Um, if you look at – even look at the Cascades, each volcano is probably being fed individually by a different source. So wow. there are they they share the process, but they're probably being fed by different places that are melting in the mantle. So that you know, Lassen is not connected to Shasta, is not connected to Hood or something like that. Okay. They are separate points where melting is occurring, forming the volcanoes. Where um, and that's a, that's an ongoing question: is why are volcanoes located where they are? Um, like in the Cascades, why are they separated? You know, they're they're kind of roughly separated by equal distances. Why would that be the case? So there's a lot of unanswered questions of exactly why volcanoes form where they do uh, in places like the the Cascades. In, in these in these mushes where you've got 
some length of time where this uh, roughly molten material and this quasi crystalline material in contact. Do, do you get it? Does it sit there long enough to reach equilibrium states where, you, where you, you see compositions that reflect an equilibrium that's been established, or is it continuously never reaching that point? It's because probably until the volcano goes entirely extinct. Okay. You're probably never it's reaching a never true close. equilibrium. You're probably just sitting there, and, and every once in a while, you're heating things back up again. You're cooling them back down. Uh, different parts of the the mush are cooling at different rates, depending on if it's near the edge of the mush versus the middle of the mush. There's a lot of variability from what we've been able to see looking at different um, different volcanoes. What what the crystals come up that come up in the eruptions look like? Okay. Well, Eric, could you give us a little background? What, what was your trajectory into um, science and, and geology? Sort of, what, what were your, what was your interest as a, a young young person? And oh, where you are? I, mean, I, I took a very long and winding road to where I got. Um, I mean, on one hand, there are signs that this was inevitable because um, you know my mother's Colombian. I spent a lot of my youth in Colombia. Um, near volcanoes, so that had a pretty uh, profound effect on me as a young kid, like, uh, you know, five, six, seven-year-old, that sort of thing. Um, you know, but once I got, you know, I had, an, I went to a small liberal arts school for college and majored in geology and history and kind of wasn't sure I thought I'd go into radio even at some point before I graduated. So it took me a while to realize that geology is what I found most interesting and that hanging around geologists was also what I found most interesting. So that's what pointed me in this direction. And even before I went to grad school, I couldn't decide if I wanted to work on volcanoes or work on glaciers. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's a lot of different events that, um, that sort of, Ended, ended up with me being somebody who works on volcanoes for a living. Um, but by no means have I thought since I was young that that was the only path for me. I followed a lot of different avenues, and um, there probably would have been a lot of them that, that could have worked out, and this one is just one of them that worked out. So uh, that's, that's how I find, a, find myself teaching it now at a small liberal arts school, um, teaching about volcanoes. Okay. We've got another question from our Google Hangout uh, followers. You see it there? Okay. okay, let's see where I can um, wander myself down. Um, so, okay, so these are the questions of the earthquakes in Nevada and Oklahoma. Um, you know, both of those, from my knowledge, the earthquake swarms are unrelated to anything volcanic, which is one thing. Uh, the ones in Oklahoma, to my knowledge, are related more to human intervention, right. where we're you know pumping fluid wastewaters back into the crust, and it's causing faults to move. So a lot of the earthquakes in Oklahoma are, are probably being caused by human action. The ones in Nevada, I'm not as familiar with, at least the ones that are going on right now. There's a lot of little faults that crisscross west, uh, western Nevada. And those faults can reactivate and cause earthquake swarms like the ones we're seeing now. So I'd say that none of them are indicative of something bigger brewing as much as just, you know, either <laughs> what humans are doing or what's normal for um, the sort of active western part of North America. We've seen over the past several years in Arkansas due to an increase in uh, natural gas drilling and fracking. Yep. Uh, increase in those low level three to four or even lower um, magnitude earthquakes. Yep. Uh, Arkansas has got interesting geology because you know it's floodplain um, mm -hmm. from Mississippi, and so it's it, it got a good shaking. It would turn liquid. So yep. It doesn't take much to propagate a wave to propagate in that material. Uh, yep. So that's an interesting and pretty scary <laughs> situation to be in. Yeah, I'm I mean. Close to Memphis. There's definitely examples in Arkansas of exactly that, of, of where the correlation between pumping fluids back into the crust and, um, and earthquakes is, is hard to deny. Yeah. So 
uh, there we're seeing how humans can play a role in, in geologic events. Right, right. Um, so your, your experiences as a, as a young person uh, in looking at geological features, either glaciers or um, uh, rock formations, have led you to where you are now, but, but if you could talk to your younger self, uh, you could go back in time and, and tell a younger person who is uh, as an undergraduate right now, yep. uh, what would you tell them? What sort of advice would you give young people um, starting off their careers in science? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, I mean, hmm. You know, a lot of it is 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 preparing yourself. There's only so much that you can do at it during your undergraduate education to to the background that you need to tackle things that you're going to be interested in. Yeah. So what you really need to do is, is teach yourself or become comfortable with how you can learn ideas on your own without needing to have to be walked through it in a class or formal activity. And that's tricky because a lot of the times we want it to be, you know, here's what we're doing today. These are the things that you need to do to do this thing that we're doing. And that's that. And that only gets you so far. Because a lot of the stuff that I do is not stuff that I learned as, as an undergrad. It's stuff that, that I've afterwards. And a lot of it is things that required me to figure stuff out on my own. So that's where you really need to, to spend some time. Not, you know, if you're getting frustrated, frustrated with assignments that, that you're doing, Realize that what is trying, what you're trying to learn, is not necessarily how to do the assignment. It's how to figure out how to approach the assignment. If you follow me, um, the answer is less important sometimes than the process of figuring out how you might get to the answer. So that's that's one thing that I think is useful to realize is that although the the results and the grades, of course, are and seem really important, the the process of figuring out how to learn is probably more important. And it's something that you don't realize at the time because you are really focused on what the grades are that you're getting for the assignments. So that that's probably one bit of advice. I don't know how, um, how faculty might feel about some of that advice, but that's really what I think is that it's, it's the process ends up being really the thing that you carry with you more so than a lot of the information. Right. And I, I think since you also mentor undergraduates uh, through research projects, that's sort of codified within that experience of, you know, okay, yeah, you've got your book learning, but yep. here's a project, and here you need to figure out, this is something new, we're at the cutting edge. How do yep. we do this? What's the unknown? And then how can we both go through and understand what's happening? Yep, uh, yeah, because there are definitely projects that we don't have, of course, answers to before we start. Right. So, you know, it's a, it's a lot of the sort of assignments I give my students even in class are like, here's a pile of data. Here's some ways that you can look at it. Tell me something interesting. Try to come up with some interesting observation that you can make from it. Because that's really, you know, just getting used to how you approach problems is really important. Right, right. It's a very useful skill to have, you're right, yes. once, once you get comfortable with that. And your own um, blind sides where you know that you make mistakes, Yep. You watch out for those places where you know you make mistakes. Yep. It's a learning process. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions whenever you're having problems with things. That's another thing is that it's, in a sense, an ideal student should have no ego. Because right. you should just be willing to admit when you have no clue what's going on. That's right. But it's embarrassing. You feel like, oh, I want to be, you know, looked upon as being, you know, not very smart. But that, that's not the case at all. Better to ask than to <laughs> get too far, and then it's like, oh no, why didn't you say something? That could yeah, be exactly. You know. All right. You guys have any other questions? Um, all right, Lucas. I have a question. I noticed when you were talking about the students that you uh, worked with, you said you had one during the summer program. Uh, does your university have a, an RU an institution where you offer a summer programs to students that aren't necessarily going to that university? Yeah, not so. 
I mean, that's a good question. For a lot of the students, for I guess for two of the three students, they were being funded by an endowment that we have for Denison students during the summer. The, the third one was being funded for by an NSF grant that I had received to do the project. So we don't, that one wouldn't, doesn't necessarily have, wouldn't have to be a Denison student. But I don't have a specific, we don't have one at the university that necessarily, an REU that would do that. Although it's something that would be interesting to approach. Because, you know, it would be great to have different students um, working together from different universities on some of these projects. That would be really cool. Um, like a, either a consortium of um, um, institutions and faculty that have uh, an emphasis in, say, geology or geophysics might yep. get pulled together and work together, especially if you go on site uh, for a, um, a field trip, you know, to collect yep. data. That would yeah, be and there's, cool. there's the, the Keck Geology Consortium is sort of like that, where there's a bunch of small liberal arts schools that propose projects every uh, summer that can um, that students from different schools take part in. There's you know, maybe about a do, uh, I think it's a dozen schools. Okay. Um, so you know there are some of these that exist. For there, it's all just within the small liberal arts um, context, but. Um, there are definitely plenty of people I know who have REUs that bring in people from all sorts of different institutions. Cool. All right, Ron's got another question for you there. Okay, uh, social media. Um, this is a tricky one because I, I, a lot of my use of blogging and Twitter um, has really, I can't say that I have planned it at all. It mm. just sort of happens. Um, you know, what I guess if you want to know how to if people are interested if you have things that you're interested in you should write about them on a blog and that if it's things that other people are interested in they will likely find you so and it really helps in terms of getting you used to writing about topics that are are interesting you know if you're worried about writing skills there's nothing better than writing a lot to work on those writing skills blogging is one way to do it um, you know, there's a tricky beast because um, it's hard. The content, a lot of it is just pointing people to other content. So what you want to do is it's a great resource for making contacts with other people who might be interested in the topics you're interested in, who might that you're interested in. Um, and that's where I've had some interesting interactions with people. Um, about different volcanic topics at least is via Twitter where you can really find out a lot of information really quickly especially when an eruption is about to uh, when eruption is starting this is where you find information um, from people who are there you find pictures of the eruption from people who are right around the volcano it's a good place to gather information um, and a good place to make contacts with people who are interested in the same things you are so would you recommend then something that undergrads at least look into uh, as far as networking or collecting interesting contacts? Yeah. I mean, it's a good place to start. And if you follow people who are interested in the things that you are interested in, you'll you'll end up getting exposed to lots of different ideas and yeah. lots of different um, writing, and yeah. that that helps because that it's hard to find all of that stuff out there on the internet by yourself. Right. Yeah, I, I would definitely echo that that comment about finding people that you can learn from. Uh, oftentimes, in social situations, we we tend to surround ourselves with people like ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. so you you don't really get that diffusion length is pretty long. You're not getting new ideas diffusing into your sphere because yep. you know you're surrounding yourself with people just like you. But you can follow interesting people that are very smart on Twitter and you I have learned more probably from um, fellow teachers and other people on the internet that are academics in terms of different fields of study than I would ever have learned on my own so yeah it definitely is a great resource and but, you never know you never know the sorts of connections that you're gonna make yeah. on Twitter that will lead you in weird directions like you know one of the the people that I follow there a lot of them are geologists there's a lot of scientists mm -hmm. and then there's you know there's things like one of 
you know, it's weird to talk about people who are your Twitter friends. Yeah. That you, <laughs> what my what, what, one Twitter friend of mine is a is a baseball writer, mm-hmm. and he has he ended up actually writing a post for my volcano blog because he's interested in volcanoes, yeah. and I wrote one for his baseball blog about volcanoes, in particular about what would happen if Mount Rainier erupted, um, uh, to to yeah, the Seattle yeah. Mariners because this uh, this uh, writer. It, Starting about the Mariners and now writes about really cool uh, analysis of, of mo- like pitch framing and other things related to, to baseball. Um, and you, those are connections you would never make with right. that of social media. Right. Could you tell us the history of uh, the Wired blog? How did you get oh. that So eruptions I've been writing since 2008. Wow. I started off. It started off um, because I realized that there weren't any volcanologists writing about volcanic eruptions on online. Mm-hmm. So I started it in 2008 as just a WordPress blog, mm-hmm. and then it was picked up. I, I was asked if I wanted to join a a, a, a social uh, a science blogging network. And I've gone through a couple of them before landing at Wired a few years ago, and I've been very happy at Wired since then. So, you know, it's just, it's actually just an extension of what I've been doing since 2008, where I can write about volcanic eruptions, write about um, research that I, I've run into with volcanoes, write about um, the, the hazards, you know, the social impacts of volcanic eruptions. There's a lot of different directions, you know, how volcanoes are portrayed in the media. Um, and it's it's wired as a good platform for it because it gets that broader audience of people who are ideally interested in uh, science and technology. So right. um, it's it's been a pretty good uh, a pretty good combination for me to be able to to work out of that group of science bloggers um, who are part of the Wired Science Blog Network. Yeah, there's some remarkable uh, blog blogs that are part of the network. How does your university look at that uh, in terms of outreach? Um, I'm lucky. Denison really gets it. Good. And our current president definitely gets it. So um, they have been very supportive along the whole process, or along the whole way, uh, as I've been working my way through the ranks here. Yeah. So I've been, I've been very lucky that they're a university that realizes that, you know, faculty do this sort of thing are are uh, the, there's an, a value added component here of um, not only getting the name of your university out there because uh-huh. you're out there talking to people and writing uh, on social media and writing blogs and then being interviewed on uh, the radio and that sort of thing because people found your post that sort of stuff but you know it keeps people it, at least it keeps me thinking about stuff a Outside of just what I'm doing in my own personal research, so it, it's I think it's a win-win-win. I can't remember how many parties are now involved in this, but there's a lot of people winning in it. Cool. <laughs> well, Anything else? I think I think that's got us. Okay. Uh, any other question? Nothing has popped up on Twitter, so definitely we want to thank our speaker one last time. We, we appreciate you spending an hour, uh, more than an hour, almost an hour and a half now with us uh, talking about uh, some fascinating subject. Uh, appreciate your time, and um, hopefully we'll get you to come back sometime. Yep, thank you. Uh, I'll be sending you an email uh, with some more information uh, right. to wrap up with what our um, uh, university uh, foundation account can uh, help reimburse you a little bit. So okay. we will be uh, getting to bring you back uh, in, a, in a short period of time. All right. All right, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.